This is the Human Action Podcast with your hosts, Jeff Deist and Dr. Bob Murphy. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to another episode of the Human Action Podcast. We are discussing this week the labor market and what's going on out there with companies and hiring and employment after our show last week with Alex Pollock on the housing market. If you missed that, I encourage you to go back and check it out. You will be absolutely shocked and amazed at the degree to which not only the Federal Reserve Bank, but the federal administrative agencies are involved in what we think of as a free market in housing. And I suspect uh, there's a lot more foolishness going on with labor markets as well. So joined as always by my co-host, Dr. Bob Murphy, and our special guest is Dr. Peter Klein. Of course, many of you are familiar with his work uh, at the Mises Institute as a senior fellow. He's also quite a big shot over at Baylor University, where he is a professor of entre entrepreneurship and also chairs the entrepreneurship program there. So Peter is author of a brand new book, 2022, with Nikolai Foss, another friend of ours called Why Managers Matter, The Perils of the Bossless Company. So Peter, all that said, uh, let me throw this one out to you. I think anecdotally, a lot of us are seeing and feeling uh, a disconnect in the labor market when we go to, let's say, a fast food restaurant, when we go to a, a, a mini mart, we see that they're not sweeping the trash. It, it feels like there's something really profound going on since COVID. And I, I'd like to get your opening thoughts on that. Yeah, Jeff, I think you're exactly right. Um, you know, you mentioned in your intro that uh, all kinds of markets that people uh, assume are, you know, operating in a free market or uh, according to the principles established by economists who study free markets. Uh, and we learned that in energy markets and all kinds of other, uh, you know, uh, cases, what we see is really the result of widespread, you know, government intervention. It, you know, it couldn't be more true with the labor market as well, that we have anything but sort of a free market in labor, whether you're looking at entry level employment or even, you know, uh, more professional uh, uh, kinds of activities. So, yeah, things have been pretty crazy since 2020. Some of it, I think, reflects longer term trends, but absolutely uh, the COVID related lockdowns, supply chain disruptions and other uh, interventions have caused, you know, a tremendous amount of disruption in the labor market. And we're still seeing the effects now. And were you writing the book during COVID? Presumably. So, yes, we had started the book actually before uh, COVID occurred. Okay. And, you know, we, we didn't want to make it a book about COVID, although we right. have a few passing mentions. Uh, the manuscript was, you know, sort of mostly uh, completed by uh, early 2021. But yeah, I mean, I think the lessons of the book about how companies should be organized, how people, uh, you know, respond to different kind of work conditions and work environments those lessons certainly, you know, can provide us a lot of insight about what's going on now in our post-COVID world. Can, can I just jump in on that one real quick, Peter? And I don't mean to uh, ambush you here with something off the wall that you're not ready to answer. But I, I what I noticed was all these restaurants are, we're hiring, we're hiring, we're hiring. And I knew two teenagers and I was even driving one of them around. And in one of them, it was a friendlies. And I go in and the manager says, yeah, we're not really hiring, even though the big sign out front so is that some sort of disconnect, like corporate wants to have goodwill with the public and say, oh, we're hiring, even though they're not? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. I mean, I don't I don't I, I have. No, tell me about evidence. friendlies in the specific location I'm talking about. I want you to know. Well, Bob, I've been tracking your location, actually. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not aware of any evidence that that's sort of a systematic pattern. I'm sure there is disconnect between what's going on at the local level and the corporate level for large organizations and franchise chains and so forth. But no, I mean, there really are a lot of, uh, uh, you know, local employers who are, uh, you know, there's, you know, excess, certainly they have unfilled positions, partly because of, diff you know, changing attitudes among the labor force, partly because mm. people, um, uh, you know, there are all kinds of barriers to hiring even entry level workers that make it difficult for those markets to clear. I, I don't know about that, the specific case, but I, it wouldn't right. surprise me if, yeah, there's some, you know, sort of corporate level initiatives that might include some of that might be marketing and PR, right, to indicate yeah. that, yes, we're growing, we're strong, we really need more folks, just as, you know, corporate employers will often say, uh, you know, to universities, 
right? Here are the kinds of, here's what we, the skills that we want your graduates to have. We want critical thinkers. We want English majors and so forth. Uh, but really what they want is people who have, you know, basic accounting skills. But do you think that this shift we felt, I know Nicholas Eberstadt at AEI has updated his book on men missing from the workforce to account for COVID. I just wonder, do you think a nasty recession would, would shock everybody back into the old modes and manners of looking for a job? Or do you think this is actually a fundamental shift where COVID has made people rethink whether they want to do some crappy $12 an hour job? Yeah, I think it's both. I think there are you know, longer term cultural trends, social and cultural trends. You know, some of it is generational. You know, the, the whole sort of uh, storyline about millennials and Gen Zs having different attitudes toward the workplace, different attitudes toward work-life balance and so forth. I mean, I think that's a little bit overblown, but there certainly is something, you know, there is some evidence that attitudes towards those things are changing, you know, because of uh, a lot of uh, younger workers have grown up in relatively affluent circumstances. You know, they haven't had to work and fight and scrimp and save and so forth. Then again, we've been hearing about those trends for many, many decades, right? Even older workers, you know, uh, uh, Gen Xers and, and boomers grew up in the post-war era and they heard from their depression era parents mm -hmm. that, oh, you guys have it made. You don't know what it's really like to, you know, scrimp and save. So that's been going on, you know, for a long time. But yeah, I think even before COVID, there was some evidence that, younger workers were, you know, had different priorities maybe than their parents, seeing their parents, you know, have to work very hard even to be able to afford, you know, a three bedroom house and a couple of vacations a year. And some younger workers have said, yeah, I'm not interested in doing that. They also grew up in a different era in terms of communication and networking and everything with their digital devices and so forth. They have a different kind of pattern of work you know, working eight to five without distractions, I mean, is something that's increasingly hard for all of us because of the, you know, the, the sort of different communications world in which we live, the way we interact with each other. So getting people to be free of distractions for an extended period to work on the assembly line, that just doesn't appeal to folks the way it did. So I think there are some longer term trends that were maybe exacerbated. You know, then you get this big shock that's not only a massive economic dislocation with supply chains being shut down, people you know ordered to their homes, but also you get um, stimulus checks, you get sort of a you know exacerbation maybe of this attitude that hey well maybe I can get by with a little help from Uncle Sam from the taxpayer um, you know wh why should I go out there and put myself on the line when I see other people who are just sort of cruising they're staying at home they're still getting a you know, a check, uh, they're getting a government check. Why shouldn't I do the same? An example, too, I think of the the difference in perspective, depending on uh, your demographics. I, I complained once on Twitter. I mean, well, I complained more than once on Twitter, but <laughs> one of the times I complained on Twitter, it was uh, that, the fact of how it, it, big stores, like they're, they're forcing everybody now to do self-checkout. Like, like it started out that that was just like an interesting little luxury, you know, an option that they offered in addition to the 16 cashiers. And now it's, you know, they've transitioned. There's like one line with a cashier that's, you know, really long. And so you kind of have no choice. So I was complaining about that. And then I noticed a bunch of younger people were just like, hey, old man, get with the times, you know, self-checkout's great and whatever, like boomer. And I'm not a boomer, by the way. But I realized part of what it is, is that, yeah, they probably have, you know, they go to the store once a day to get six items and what they're going to eat for dinner that night. Whereas, you know, I'm loading up with a bunch of kids and getting baby formula and diaper. And so, you know, th there is a difference there that, yeah, for them, it actually is more convenient. They don't want some stranger touching all their stuff. They can just pet bag it real quickly. Where for me, it's literally a half an hour to check out myself, whereas I'd rather put it on the conveyor belt. So there's stuff like that. Another one, too, is I was walking down an employee's going by and I said, hey, is such and such an aisle 14? And he goes, probably. And he just kept walking. <laughs> <laughs> and I complained about that on Twitter. And then some people were like, well, yeah, because everybody our age knows you use your phone to find something in a store. You wouldn't ask an employee. Why would you do that? You yeah. Know, what, so. what I like is when when you do ask an employee, as, as I will, uh, they'll just pull out their phone and go to the right. store's app. And I think, oh, I could have done that myself. But Bob, I'm glad you mentioned automation and te you know technical change. That's certainly part of the story as well. And you know, we all know that um, uh, 
you know, there's a sort of Luddite argument that, oh, replacing uh, the, the checkout clerk with uh, with a scanner, uh, having people, uh, you know, do their order on their phone or go into McDonald's and, you know, click uh, to type on a kiosk, uh, you know, is, is causing dislocation in the labor market. Right. I mean, you, you don't need as many frontline employees, maybe as you did before, because we have different interfaces for ordering and picking up and paying and even more automated forms of delivery and so forth. You know, so there's this sort of Luddite argument that, oh, well, that's throwing people out of work and that's why people are unable to find jobs. So, you know, one reaction to that, and I think the correct reaction in general is to say, well, yeah, I mean, the introduction of new technology, right, it, 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 it put some changes into the labor market. It changes the kinds of jobs that are desired, uh, but it doesn't cause uh, an employment per se, because yeah, you don't need somebody to ring up your order, but you need somebody to design and maintain the, the machine that now takes care of your order. And there are people who make the machines and you know service the machines and make the other complementary equipment and perform other jobs. So there's no net loss of jobs necessarily, with the introduction of any kind of new technology, but there is a reallocation, right? Now, that reallocation doesn't happen instantaneously, right? It can be messy, it can be sticky. Of course, where we have all kinds of unemployment, uh, you know, uh, uh, legal restrictions and, and, and labor mobility restrictions. So you already have that kind of messy relocation process, reallocation process going on. Now throw in mandatory lockdowns and school closures and you know business shutdowns and you know even now we're feeling the effects of supply chain disruptions from two years ago you know in other parts of the world so that just makes that process all the messier and i suspect that some of the you know help wanted yet nobody wants to apply you know it, it is it's it, it's part of that you know larger scale change in the kinds of jobs that are out there the kinds of work that you know in the economy we need people to perform mm -hmm. But you know the progressive argument is quite simple. Treat people better, pay them more. Sure. I'd love to be treated better and paid more myself. But yeah, of course, uh, it, it's lovely to have such benevolent feelings, you know, towards our you know fellow men and women. And I hope that we all do. But, you know, that really doesn't have that kind of argument um, doesn't account for how labor markets operate and you know, how voluntary contracting takes place. I'll give you another example. Uh, last week, the uh, Biden administration, uh, Lena Khan at the FTC, announced a proposal to ban almost all non-compete agreements, uh, which have been very controversial for a number of years. And uh, certain states have tried to clamp down on non-competes for like tech workers and so forth. And, you know, the, the argument is, well, it's unfair to workers Right, that if they quit job A, they're not allowed immediately to, you know, to try to go to competitor in job B. This lowers wages, and it's an example of employers, you know, exploiting their market power in the labor market and so forth. You know, and I've been thinking about this issue for quite some time. And what people often forget is that, um, you know, markets tend to adjust. Markets have a way of working around certain kinds of obstacles, not instantly, of course. But there are systematic tendencies in that direction. For example, you know, if I'm looking to hire programmers or even entry level workers, right, if I can impose a non compete restriction, if I can ask those employees, if those employees are willing to sign a non compete agreement, that makes their labor more valuable to me than it other, otherwise would be. So if the law tells me I'm not allowed to ask for a non compete clause to put that in the contract, well, then this uh, worker is now less attractive to me than would otherwise be the case. So what am I going to do? I'm either going to pay less because I'm getting a, you know, the marginal value product, as we would say, is lower than it otherwise would be. Or I'm going to try to impose some other kind of restriction to sort of recoup that loss of value from not being able to impose uh, the non-compete. In other words, if you limit what employers can do on one margin, they can attempt to adjust on other margins. And it's it's not clear that workers are systematically better off. In fact, I would argue restricting the range of allowable options for labor market contracting will tend to make workers on average, most workers, worse off than they otherwise would be. You know, some won't be hired at all. Others will be hired into less desirable jobs. 
Others will be hired with less desirable conditions in those jobs. It's an example of how, you know, uh, do-gooder sort of thinking, oh, well, gosh, it seems really mean and unfair not to let workers apply for any job they want if they quit one job. Let's try to be nice and do them a favor. You know, as, as Mises would say, you know, wishful thinking is not a substitute for sound reasoning about the likely impact of a particular law or policy. And a lot of the progressive attempts to, you know, make the lives of workers better, whether it's minimum wages or the stuff we're talking about now, as is well known, right, tend to have the opposite effect. Yeah, that reminds me, Peter, um, one time somebody from The Daily Show uh, contacted me and they said, yeah, we're thinking about doing a piece or, you know, a bit on it was mandated parental leave at the time was the hot item. Mm -hmm. And they said, I, I looked on the internet and you're like the only person I could find who was actually against this. <laughs> and so I, it turned out, you know, punchline, I never got on the show or anything. We didn't, they didn't go forward with it, but you know, and I was trying to exaggerate. I was like, well, suppose they had a rule, a law that said if a woman gets pregnant while she's working for you, you have to buy her an SUV. Cause that would be very convenient to, you know, good, take the kid around. Don't you think that might make employers less willing to hire women on the front end, especially if they were in their twenties and married and, you know, I don't know whether, like, I sounded so reasonable, the person said, let's not put him on the camera, or I, I don't know, or just, wow, this guy's yeah. really nuts. He's not even kidding. He believes this stuff. Yeah, I, I don't know. know. Bob, in my experience, you know, uh, the reductio ad absurdum rhetorical move doesn't work as well as it used to work because people just go along with the absurdity. Well, yeah, right, of course right. we should do that. Why yeah, why wouldn't we do that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it might be unconstitutional. That's the only reason we wouldn't. Yeah. But, you know. but Peter, one, one change here. Prior to COVID, anyway, you know, the, the last 20 years, we've been sold this narrative, especially about successful companies in the U.S. in term, you know, the Amazons of the world, the Googles of the world, especially in the tech sector, that there is a new uh, style of management, which is very uh, flat in structure, very team based, very non hierarchical. And that this is the way of the future, especially now that you have to attract workers, you have to do more to keep them happy by allowing them to work from home, all this sort of stuff. And that's really the thrust of what your book with Nikolai Foss is about, this idea, hey, hey, hold on a minute. It turns out that intermediaries, managers, even hierarchy are important in a company. So maybe you can give us a little bit about the thesis of the book and apply it to where we are today. Yeah, inspired by uh, you know our idol Bob Murphy, we also wanted to to, to offer a contrarian take on a popular uh, uh, you know sort of trend. And uh, yeah, Jeff, Jeff, you summarized the the the, the hook uh, for the book really well. Namely, there is this there's a belief we call it a narrative that um, in the new in the new world in the modern you know knowledge based networked high tech economy. The sort of traditional kind of workforce with a with a with a managerial hierarchy, you know, issuing orders down the line and so forth, is uh, you know doesn't apply anymore. Is not useful. Uh, is not attractive to workers and doesn't allow companies to be flexible and and lean and respond to changes in the environment and so forth. And therefore, all companies should try to adopt a leaner flatter, more flexible structure. We call it the bossless company narrative because some of its proponents do say, you know, the, 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 the way to think about this model is everyone is his own boss, right? We get rid of bosses, we get rid of managers. Okay, maybe we have some people with former managerial titles, but the spirit of this new movement is that everyone is, you know, everyone is in charge of his or her own labor and activities, and we try to coordinate things as loosely as possible, and we empower people to make the best decisions that they can without, you know, sort of the oppression of the traditional managerial structure. So what we argue in the book is first, what we, we talk about that narrative, and to use a modern fashionable term, we deconstruct it, right, and show that, first of all, um, you know, there are a few companies, a few well-known companies that have embraced this sort of radically decentralized, flat uh, managerial model, but only a few companies have done so. And most of the companies that have attempted to use this model have, have, have found that it didn't work well and they ended up abandoning it and going back to a more traditional model. Uh, second, uh, a lot of the uh, hype around this narrative is purely that it's just hype. A lot of the companies that advertise or, or have been described you know, by uh, uh, in, in the magazines and by management gurus and so forth as having a radically decentralized structure really don't. 
they just have cute job titles or they have clever lingo and, and it's sort of a marketing spiel, but really they are organized in a fairly traditional manner. And third, the conventional managerial structure, which as we emphasize does not mean, you know, command and control where you have worker drones who are like lemmings, you know, just sort of doing what they're told. That's not what the traditional managerial structure is, but properly understood the traditional structure still works pretty well in the vast majority of cases. It still works well for tech companies, for modern companies, you know, for companies with millennial and Gen Z employees and so forth. So we're trying to offer kind of a restatement, a defense and restatement of the traditional understanding of what management is, what a good manager does, how management works. And we hope to provide some advice for practicing managers about how they can you know, improve their management practices, be better leaders, be better organizers, and so on. P Peter, can I ask at this point, is it, because um, I, I imagine some Austrian readers will wonder, because cer certainly like at a high enough level, you don't need there to be a boss. Like, you know, you want things to be decentralized. You don't want a central plan to run the whole economy. And yet some of your, um, you know, the snippets from your book taken in isolation might sound like you're saying, well, I mean, for really important decisions, you can't just leave it up to the, the system. You got to have somebody in charge to make the tough choice. Right. It's, it's so how do you, I, I know there's not a contradiction there, but you get what I'm saying like that, that apparent tension. How would you resolve that? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, in, in, in in that way, this book and our story is very countercultural within the Austrian and libertarian movements. And we sort of did that on purpose, you know, to be provocative and uh, to, to, you know, to, to, to get some discussion started. But that is one of the points that we make in the book. We do talk about the contrast between how economic systems as a whole are organized and how voluntary groupings of individuals, whether they're in families or you know, nonprofit organizations or churches or community groups or for-profit business ventures are, are organized along a, a very different model, right? I mean, obviously there are commonalities, right? Some of the arguments that have been made, of course, by the great thinkers, Mises, Hayek, others, about why top-down central planning doesn't work, uh, lack of property rights, lack of a price mechanism, weak incentives, the knowledge problem and so forth. Yeah, there's a lot of insight from thinking about those, thinking about those problems gives us a lot of insight into how private organizations can be run and run more effectively. But we argue there's kind of a basic category mistake in thinking that a private group is exactly the same as uh, you know a decentralized larger society like the market system. So absolutely, the fact that um, managerial coordination provides some benefits when producing widgets does not imply that we need uh, state actors to exercise that same kind of managerial authority in a, uh, you know, in an economy-wide context. Mises points this out in, in several places, but especially in his book, Bureaucracy. And I sometimes remind uh, my students uh, because they, it's easy to get sort of, this is sort of a subtle point, because they read, for example, Ronald Coase's famous article on the nature of the firm, and Ronald Coase, quoting another British author, D.H. Robertson, describes the firm as an island of socialism. And what Coase means by that is within the firm, you know, there's not negotiation and bargaining on every single point. Sometimes the boss just tells you what to do, and you have to go do it. In fact, according to Coase, that's the distinguishing characteristic of the employment relationship as opposed to other kinds of voluntary contracts that you agree to sort of subordinate your day-to-day -day authority to a supervisor who can tell you on a given day, hey, Bob, go over here and clean the toilets. I don't have to justify that to you. Just go over and do it. Um, but the, the, the full quotation uh, 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 there is that the firm is an island of socialism, you know, within a sea of the market. So in other words, you have these firms that may have some managerial authority, you know, exercised in a, in a strong way. They're, they're competing against other little islands of socialism, right, in the, in the great sea of the market. And so if a particular kind of managerial structure is not performing well, Right, if the boss is exercising too much discretion, is not allowing workers to use their own tacit knowledge and you know, and self motivate to figure out what they should do on a given day, then that organization is going to be less effective, less efficient 
than a more decentralized organization in you know producing goods and services that satisfy consumer wants. So in the market, entrepreneurs can experiment with different organizational structures. Some of them more flat, some of them more you know uh, vertical, some of them more decentralized, some of them more centralized. We can those can compete. You know, entrepreneurs compete in that dimension on the market. And in some circumstances, one model will work better. In other circumstances, another model will work better. And there's no contradiction between allowing that kind of private authority in a competitive setting and claiming that, well, we don't want a central, we don't want a single authority. We don't want one mind, one will acting, as Mises puts it, controlling resource allocation in the entire economy. But uh, to, to go back to your question, we did we did write some of our arguments in a way that was a little bit cheeky. There's a little bit of inside mm -hmm. baseball because we know that some right. Austrian readers and libertarian readers will say, wait a minute, that doesn't sound like what I read. You know, that's not the way I learned about spontaneous order, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then we sort of explain carefully, yes, we're not, we're not, we're not saying that centralized authority is good for the market as a whole. Kim, just to follow real fast. So there was a lot there, but is, is part of what you're saying there to distill some of it out that, yeah, for any given task that needs to be done or whatever that, or resources that should be organized in a certain way, there's pros and cons of more versus less centralization and go ahead and let, let it rip. And it can't be the case that decentralization is always better because then there wouldn't be firms in the first place. Yeah. It would just be individuals. And so given that a firm exists, there probably does need to be some sort of hierarchical structure. Otherwise, you wouldn't even have that. There'd be no reason for that firm at all. Yeah, the, the way we put it is, you know, all all kinds of human cooperation, right, especially in the economic sphere, have to overcome basic problems of coordination and cooperation, right? We've got to get, the, the you know, we have to get people to act in a way such that, you know, uh, my contribution to the joint project is complementary to your contribution, Bob and Jeff's contribution, right? And there are different ways that we can do that. There may be some cases where we can eat, each, you know, have full autonomy in the action that we choose and the tools that we use and the characteristics of the outputs that we produce. And then we find some way to make it all, to make it all match up, to make it all coordinate and to get it where we're all putting forth effort, you know, that's complementary to everybody else's effort. And there are lots of, you know, again, the market system as a whole, as we know from, you know, Leonard Reed's classic essay, I Pencil, right? In that context, the price mechanism, private property and resource allocation through markets and prices is a very effective way of getting people to coordinate their behavior over vast distances and time and space, you know, to produce the simple good of a pencil. But in contrast, I mean, look at this podcast that we're doing now, right? There's the three of us plus our technical support. You know, there's four people who have to be logged on to this system. We've got to have certain kinds of microphones and, you know, uh, speakers and lighting, and we've got to have the right kind of internet connection and so forth. I mean, we could have done this by, you know, Jeff saying, okay, you know, Bob, figure out some way to, you know, use whatever communications technology you want. You know, Bob's going to use Zoom and Jeff is going to use Teams and Peter's going to use Skype. And we'll just ask the, the listener to dial into all three, have all three apps open at the same time and hopefully it'll work out. I mean, and sometimes we do things like that. But but typically for doing a podcast, right, it's more effective for Jeff or Jeff's technical uh, associate to, to, you know, to command us, I, I get an email saying, hey, Peter, we're going to use this technology. You need to be logged yeah. in in this way at this time. You need to have these devices set up. Everything matches. Everything works together. I mean, th think about uh, traditional, you know, the classic sort of automotive assembly line, Henry Ford's great innovation and in organizing specialization in the division of labor. I mean, you know, you got to have you know, each each different employee at if at each stage of the assembly line, you know, has some discretion about exactly how they're going to assemble their part. You know, Jeff is uh, assembling the chassis, and Bob is putting the engines together, and then Peter is dropping the engines into the chassis. Right? We don't need every aspect of each of our tasks to be coordinated directly from above. But at the same time, right? I mean, for the thing to work. We've all got to be working at a certain pace, 
right? Dif the different pieces have to fit. It, Bob's engines have to fit in Jeff's chassis for Peter to be able to drop them in. We can't have a huge backlog where Jeff is producing chassis twice as fast as Bob can make the engines. We need some mechanism to get all that stuff to coordinate. Sometimes we can do it, you know, just arm's length negotiation on an ad hoc basis by each person involved. But sometimes it makes more sense to designate another person as, you know, the boss, the coordinator, who, who you know, dictates the speed with which the things, uh, the different stages are going to happen, who works out the specifications for each part, who intervenes when there's a conflict or a dispute. Um, that's, what, that's what a manager does. That's what a hierarchical supervisor does. It doesn't mean it doesn't have to be super heavy handed, but sometimes some, you know, central coordination is just a more effective way to get people to work together. And we, there's no reason to expect that, you know, even in a completely voluntary arrangement, a stateless society, Rothbardian anarcho utopia, we would expect people to get together in groups like that from time to time and to cede some of their, you know, day to day decision rights to a coordinator. If they don't like it, they can decide not to do it the next day. No one's compelling them to join that organization. But I think we as human beings often uh, work better together when we have some kind of uh, managerial direction. So, so Peter, when we look at all this holistically, you study the firm, right? You, you write about firms. That's sort of your career. And when we think about the firm and writing about it, there's Austrian literature on that. There's, there's non-Austrian literature on that. You know, I, I, I'm trying to think of this for myself as a layperson. Uh, we, we think of someone like Robert Reich as a labor economist, self-styled. And then we think of managerial economics, I guess, which is applying economics insights to management decisions. But the study of the firm, is this a third thing? Is this separate from, from what people call managerial economics? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I guess there's a lot of overlap. I mean, to me, managerial economics is just economics applied to management problems, which include how to organize firms and how to hire workers, you know, HR issues, marketing issues, operations issues, really anything that is involved in management. Maybe the way I would describe it is, Look, I mean, there are uh, sort of, you know, d empirical phenomena or domains and contexts. And then there are kind of, you know, analytical or theoretical tools or lenses within which we study those kind of contexts. So to me, the study of firms or the study of management, you know, that's more sort of phenomenon based. And there might be, you know, one could do that from an interdisciplinary lens, right? One can study managerial problems, production problems, operation problems, marketing problems from the point of view of Austrian economics. One could also study it from the point of view of, you know, mainstream economics or Marxist economics, though I wouldn't advise that. One can study it from the perspective of sociology or psychology, right? So, so something like management, I view as an interdisciplinary subject that uh, you know incorporates insights from lots of different academic disciplines. My own specialization is you know Austrian economics, and that's mainly what I try to bring to the you know bring bring to bear on the phenomenon. But I recognize that yeah, I mean you know some managerial issues are about human psychology, and you know people like me have to sort of rely on the insights from that psychology literature, you know, and try to apply them uh, uh, you know where appropriate to understand firms. So I think understanding firms can be done through a lot of different, you know, a lot of different lenses. But is there a, there's a particularly Austrian perspective on entrepreneurship as in having a role in the, in the capital structure, let's say. Uh, yes. what, what about the firm? Is there a particularly Austrian theory of the firm or is, that, is, is the firm too much of an applied concept? Yeah, I mean, loosely speaking, if by Austrian theory of the firm, do we mean that? I mean, Peter Austrian Klein's theory. <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, there's a Peter Klein theory of anything interesting. For almost and everything. In yeah. That's the only one that people really need to know. Um, I, I would say there there certainly are quite a few Austrian economists, you know, Austrian trained economists who study problems of firms. I don't know that there is an Austrian theory of the firm in the same way that we say there's an Austrian theory of the business cycle. I'd say there are Austrian insights that are very useful for understanding firms but I don't know that there's like, you know, these five propositions constitute 
the Austrian theory of the firm, the way we might say, you know, an Austrian understanding of what is money or an Austrian, under, Aus, Austrian understanding of, you know, how monetary policy lengthens the capital structure and so forth to, to put business cycles in motion. I don't think we have exactly that. So to give an ex more of an inside baseball illustration of that, Peter. So like, I know what, oh, what Ronald Coase's theory of the firm is. It has to do with transaction costs and stuff like that. You know, something that's more efficient to keep them inside than between organizations. So you're saying there's no direct analog of, oh, the Austrian approach to understanding right. firms and their optimal size is, I, I guess, is there something, you know, Rothbard has that uh, passage or that, that line of argument in Man, Economy, and State when he's talking about the socialist calculation debate. And he says how, you know, a firm couldn't get to be so big that it takes up the whole planet because then it would suffer from the calculation problem. Yeah. Um, to, to me, that's an application of, yeah. you know, it's like a, a it's, it's a twist on or a take on uh, a model that is certainly consistent with Coase's argument. I don't have the quotes in front of me, but both Rothbard and Kirzner uh, say ha have passages where they say, uh, you know, we're, we're taking uh, Perfect to use to use Coase's theory as an example. You know, we're taking Coase's penetrating insight and applying it to this specific problem. Kirzner has a, a piece where he tries to sort of have a, a Hayekian sort of tacit knowledge twist on Coase's argument that uh, uh, Kirzner says, well, when Coase talks about the diminishing returns to management, the reason why firms don't grow and grow and grow, really what Coase should be he should be invoking Hayek's concept of tacit knowledge there, even though he doesn't. And he says something like, you know, this, my Kirzner's argument can be viewed as an extension of Coase's, you know, sort of analytical framework. So in that sense, yeah, I don't think the Austrians have taken the insights from people like Coase or even Herbert Simon or Armin Alshin and Harold Demsetz, uh, Oliver Williamson, to, to name some of the other well-known economists who have studied managerial problems. The Austrians don't say, well, we're offering a radical alternative to the insights of those thinkers. In fact, what we do in the book, in the second part of our book, is we offer a little bit of a primer, you know, for the lay reader, for the professional uh, reader, on, you know, what were the basic insights from people like Coase and Simon and Williamson, et cetera. And, you know, how would they apply to practical management problems? And, you know, if you didn't know better, if you didn't know that, uh, you know, that, that we in our, uh, that we have sometimes criticized those writers, uh, you know, from an Austrian perspective, you might think, uh, oh, well, they're, they're fully on board with the insights of the sort of mainstream economics of organization. Because, I mean, the truth is, both Nikolai Foss and myself, we have a lot of admiration for mainstream managerial economics, mainstream economics of organization. We think there are some problems and there's some areas where Austrian and other, uh, you know, approaches can, can add a lot of value, but we're not wholly opposed to those approaches. The, the way we Austrians might say we're wholly opposed to a Marxist or a Keynesian understanding of economic growth or business cycles or whatever. It's a much more friendly relationship, I would say. Well, I want to circle back to this idea that the labor market is dislocated, or it feels that way anecdotally right now. Let's say a whole host of new realities are here. I wonder if our framework, the idea of equilibrium in, in labor supply and demand, is broken in the sense that let's say under 40-year-olds really are going to uh, not get married or marry at a much later age, have no kids or far fewer kids, which affects their whole outlook on work and, and, and home buying. Let's say that, some, that all kinds of various forms of universal basic income are basically here to stay, whether that's rent and mortgage moratoriums when there's a pandemic, uh, it enhanced unemployment benefits, food stamps, et cetera. Let, let's just say that the idea of government intervening whether there's a pandemic, whether there's a, uh, you know, some sort of stock market crash like 2008, uh, you know, let, let's just say all, all kinds of new realities are here. Um, what does that mean for our analysis? Does that mean that everything we've learned about, about the firm is, is, is going to go out the window and these young people just aren't going to work for 12 bucks and they're going to insist on working from home and we're just in a, in a radically new world? Yeah, I mean, Jeff, I tend to be fairly conservative 
on that kind of a point, by which I mean, I think the conventional models and theories actually work pretty well to explain that. I mean, it's, it's not that different from things that we've seen before. So for example, you know, on work-life balance or, you know, attitudes towards professional advancement. I mean, look, if, if, if workers think, hey, um, higher wage is not that important to me. If it means I have to work these hours, I'm willing to take this lower paying job because I want to have more time to stay home and play video games. Well, I mean, in, you know, the labor market can sort of adjust to that in that, yeah, we'll see uh, lower wages on average, We'll see either more workers hired or firms will have to substitute, you know, other kinds of technology maybe for the labor inputs that we're missing. I guess what I mean is um, I think there's, there's a little bit of a myth maybe that, you know, the old fashioned simple explanation of the labor market, you know, there's a supply curve and a demand curve and we assume that workers only care about how much money they make and firms only care about how much they have to pay and so forth. Well, now that model doesn't apply anymore because of all this other stuff. But in truth, I mean, it's always been the case that, um, you know, the, 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 if you think about the, the exchange that's involved in a labor market transaction, right? I, as a worker, I agree to perform certain services in exchange for some certain remuneration. I mean, that's always been a kind of multidimensional complex sort of thing. I mean, some of the compensation that I receive is dollars, you know, my salary or my wage, but I also receive some compensation in the form of fringe benefits and the quality of the work environment and, you know, may, maybe advancement opportunities. I may agree to accept a wage that's less than, you know, what economists call the marginal revenue product or marginal value product. Today, for the prospect of getting promoted into a position where maybe I'll earn more than my marginal revenue product in the future. I mean, all of those kinds of nuances and subtleties and complexities, I think we sort of already had them in our understanding of the labor market. Again, go back 20 years, 30 years, when all this, uh, you know, the Card and Kruger papers came out challenging the conventional understanding of the minimum wage. I mean, for me, that was kind of a watershed moment in uh, you know, promoting a more sophisticated understanding of the labor market. Not that Card and Kruger were correct, quite the contrary, but one of the ways in which they were not correct is they were using a highly oversimplified, stylized, you know, undergrad Econ 101, you know, sort of model of the labor market in which, oh, well, um, you know, if the government pays, if the government requires firms to pay more than the equilibrium wage, the theory says we should see you know, mass unemployment, but we didn't see that in Pennsylvania. We didn't see that in New Jersey when they changed their minimum wage in Pennsylvania. You didn't, therefore, traditional Econ 101 doesn't work. No, but I mean, it's always been the case that, look, some, some fast food restaurants will, will, will go along with a higher wage, but now you don't get the, a free meal at lunch. Now you have to buy your own uniform instead of getting the uniform for free. Now you get fewer breaks or whatever, and they're willing to substitute on that margin while still employing the same number of workers. So if all you're looking at is number of workers employed and the, the statutory you know minimum wage, you don't see the relationship that you expect. You think, oh, the theory doesn't work. No, that's just from using a you know, a, 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 a naive and, and, you know, sort of silly version of the theory. So, Jeff, I think all of the phenomena that you described are super important and they're having big effects, but I don't think we need like a radically new understanding of what work is or the nature of firms or the nature of management or employment to be able to understand them. We can apply our standard, you know, ways of looking at the world and just say, oh, gosh, the government is requiring X. So firms and workers are responding, you know, with these adjustments. Why? Bob, I'll let you have the last word. Well, I, I just one last question occurs to me, and I realize this is a big topic, just as quickly or as longly or as, uh, as, as long as you want, Peter. What, what about AI? That's the one I people keep asking me about. Like, isn't that some qualitatively new thing? And yeah, all the arguments in the past about people adjusting. I mean, if if computers can think like humans and then they're, they're physically stronger than us, then, you know, they can do deep sea mining better than humans can. Like, isn't that going to permanently throw everybody out of work? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I'm, I'm reminded. Deep sea mining, Bob? Is that is that what you're thinking of? Is deep sea mining as an alternative? 
Yeah. Okay. It, it's, if, me, okay. if you guys lay me off, that's okay. what I'm doing. Right. So <laughs> at least for, for the brief window I have. Yeah. Uh, Bob, I'm, ha- I'm happy to let the, yeah. the, you know, the Terminators do all the deep sea mining, quite frankly. <laughs> but yeah, you know, at, at one level, I mean, look, imagine it's true that, you know, a future AI and maybe, you know, physical, you know, robots with physical bodies or whatever, you know, really are the same as human beings. You know, they can pass the Turing test or whatever, you know, this sounds like a Walter Block kind of conversation, you know, well, do they, would, would they have, would they have natural rights? Um, you know, do we have to, do we have to bargain with them? Can we turn them off? Can we shoot them? In my mind, we're so far away from that singularity moment that's sort of a fun and interesting thing to talk about late night, late night over a few beers. But I don't think that's the issue that's on the table now. The issue on the table now is, um, you know, AI and robotics can substitute, even today, right? They can substitute for some human functions. You might have some self-driving features in your car. You know, a kiosk at McDonald's can substitute for uh, the clerk. Your phone, you know, Siri can translate things for you without having to have a human translator. I mean, absolutely, there is there is an increase in automation, in, you know, including sort of intelligent devices. I agree with, um, uh, you know, some scholars who uh, have pointed out that the term AI is sort of over, the distinction between AI and there's sort of the science fiction sense and the stuff we use now is sort of overblown. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, Microsoft Windows is an AI in a sense, Right, so we're all using AI every day in our homes, and our cars, on the job, and our personal lives, and you know we're not sort of freaked out by it. So at, at one level, I don't think that would lead to a radical change. I mean, I think it'll be just like any other kind of automation, right? Just like when you know the steam engine could be installed in a factory in a, in a you know weaving factory, and the the, the arguments that to go back to something we started with, you know, the Luddite kind of arguments that, oh, well, this will create mass unemployment. Well, that didn't happen and that shouldn't happen because this new technology allows for the creation of other industries. It frees up labor and capital that can now flow into other activities. And I think, you know, the marginal improvements in AI and robotics that we've seen, and they really are marginal in an important sense over the last few years are no different from that. You know, chat GPT is a cool trick. I hear a lot of educators, you know, worrying and fretting that students are going to be using uh, the, the software to write all of their essays and how we tell the difference. I, I think those fears are slightly exaggerated. I think those tools are not quite as good at doing the things that people are worried about. They're not a substitute for human cognition. We're a long way away from that. So, so maybe I'm naive, but I'm, I'm not I'm not super worried that we'll see a radical change. I think this is a continuation of a long, you know, trend that in many ways, you know, has been started 200 years ago. Well, before we close, Peter, uh, tell people about the book where they can get it. Very lay friendly book, by the way. Yeah, it's called Why Managers Matter, The Perils of the Bossless Company. And as we've said on the podcast, it's it's not a technical book. It's aimed at the professional reader, at practicing managers, students, really anyone who's interested in understanding these kind of organizational managerial issues. It's written in a, a lively and engaging style. You can find it on all of the usual uh, uh, platforms and bookstores and all of the usual formats. There's Audible versions and Kindle versions, of course, to go along with your physical versions. It's reasonably priced. I think you'll enjoy it. And again, I think regular listeners of this podcast will, 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 there's like an extra layer of meaning for those of us interested in liberty and and free markets and Austrian approaches to organization. Uh, I think that just just will add sort of an extra dimension that, that many of you will enjoy. Well, it shows you that when you go with a popular publisher rather than an academic publisher, uh, the price comes way down and uh, the audience grows as a result. Peter, Bob, I want to thank you guys so much. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Thanks, Jeff. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. And in the meantime, you can find more content like this at Mises.org.